This morning's lesson, walking in the fear of the Lord. Now fear is one of those words that in English tend to have a lot of different meanings, kind of like love. In, in the Greek, there are lots of different words for fear. I think we're all probably familiar with the, the word phobos as far as fear goes. That's one of those Greek words that mean, means fear. It's, it's, uh, if anybody has a phobia, you know what that fear means. It's a, it's a restricting, terrifying kind of fear. But when we talk about walking in the fear of the Lord, that's not what we're saying. I want to begin with a verse that most of us are familiar with. Philippians 2 and 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now this, this verse is often misused in, as an excuse by some to continue to do those things that are clearly spoken against in God's Word. Now, you can't tell me what to do. Bible says work out my own salvation in fear and trembling. Well, don't understand what that verse is saying. This verse should be used, this should be an encouragement for us to seek out those areas of our lives where we are falling short and then step up closer to God's will. The fear in this verse does not describe one who is cowering under the oppression of a tyrannical ruler. This isn't Phobos here. Uh, that ruler who seeks out immediate destruction of those who fail him. This is not the God we serve. A relationship with God based on fear of hell may cause one to seek salvation. It may have been the initial motivation that God used to convict the hearts of, a, of sinners, although not always. But a salvation based on this type of fear will quickly fade when the individual begins to believe that his own behavior is pleasing to God. This is why there is so much hypocrisy among so-called Christians. They have come to the point in their lives where they neither have the dread of God nor the healthy respect for Him that would cause them to understand their shortcomings. But salvation based on a deep love for God built on respect and appreciation for all that He is and what He's done for us will only cause us to draw nearer to Him while we seek to please Him. The love of God is an integral part of our service to as well as our fear of God. When we truly love God as we should, the fear we have will be based on the possibility that we might fall short of His will. That's the fear that we should have. The writer puts it this way in Hebrews 4 and 1. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left of us of entering into His rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. The true fear of God is based on the fact that if we fail, we will disappoint the one who loved us so much that He was willing to die in our place. He died for us. Too many believe that we should fear the eternal consequences of our actions, but this is a faulty assumption. This may have once again led us to the foot of the cross, but it will not keep us there long. Our fear and trembling should be the result of the risk of failing the one who died in our place. It is hor a horrible thought to think that after Jesus did so much for us that we would manage to miss the mark as a result of our own human frailty. Hebrews 2 and 1 says, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. This is my greatest fear, that I might fail the God who loves me so much. Not eternal hellfire. We also read in 1 John 4.18, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. This is that fear, that terror, that, that worry that some might have. That type of fear is not found in love, but a healthy respect for God and a, and a desire to do those things that please Him 
and desire to refrain from failing Him, that fear will lead us in the right direction. The fear of God is not filled with torment. The fear of God is based on our love for Him that instills in us a desire to please Him. This is a completely different type of fear than the fear accompanied by torment described in 1 John. I hope all this makes sense. Does anybody? I'm not even going to go on into the commentary before I say, does anybody have any questions, any thoughts, concerns, uh, a better description of what I'm trying to get across here? We'll gladly receive it. Absolutely. Good, good. Real biblical fear of Almighty God is a topic of great prominence throughout Scripture. Yet we do not hear a great deal about it, of course. It's an, attrib it's an attribute more to be evidenced than talked about. But perhaps it is not as well understood as it should be. Since the fear of the Lord is the very beginning of both knowledge and wisdom, according to Proverbs, it is immediately obvious that our soul's enemy can wreak havoc in any soul that does not have fear of God. That soul is open to every imaginable deception, yet may be scarcely aware of it. In order to walk in the fear of the Lord, one must have the fear of the Lord. In the biblical context of our subject, the fear of God may be defined as follows. That sense of awe and reverence for God because of His great power as well as His love for man. Both awe and reverence are defined similarly as profound respect mingled with love for God whose name is in no way to be profaned. Now, I don't know about you, but I didn't get the same thing out of that that I did out of the description of what it means to fear God. I, I just, I'm having a hard time pulling that out. I see it but it's through a, dark, a glass darkly. <laughs> we need to understand what it means to fear God. Not to fear His punishment, but to fear that we might come short of His will. To fear, fear that when we see all that He's done for us, we might not be willing to do what He would have us to do. That's the fear of the Lord. Jacob's experience in Bethel illustrates the above he illustrates the above. Commentators agree that his words, how dreadful is this place, were an expression of awesome, reverent fear of God. He recognized that the Lord was in that place and that it was none other but the house of God. The New Testament reveals that the house of God is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth in 1 Timothy. Let it be noted here that the church of God is a dreadful place, a place where God is to be feared as nowhere else. It embraces the Word of God in its entirety, and it's a fearful thing to be a covenant member of this exclusive body by God's own decree. Remember also that Jacob, in the fear of God, felt constrained to make his vow to God and that he kept it. Now, his fear was based on the knowledge of God as well as his understanding of God as the Creator of all things. He respected God's authority and did not want to come short of it. Although he had failed God in the past, he now had a desire to do those things that pleased God. His life would not be perfect. He would repeatedly come short of God's will. Still, this point marks the beginning of an upward path toward God. It would yet be many years before he would know the depth of his failures and seek to please God first and foremost. But every journey has to start somewhere. Golden truth, O oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him, Psalms 34 and 9. Any thoughts, questions, comments here before we move on? This question reminds me of the Brother Williams preached one time years ago. He the stickers and love Lord, where no fear. That's one of the problems in the world now. Two things that kind of stuck out to me here uh, as you were speaking. First off, the correlation once again between the relationship of God and us and our parents and 
and child. Right. Uh, as as a child, not not really worried about my mom and dad punishing me. Just to yeah, try, mm, yep. try as they may. Yeah. Uh, I'm my own person. I, I live in my own home. I, I have my own uh, abilities that I don't have to rely on them. So I don't right. have to worry about mom and dad punishing me. But there's still something within me that doesn't want to bring shame on my mom and dad. Right. Uh, that wants to honor them. Uh, and that's the, that's the fear that we've got to have back to the Lord is not to worry, oh, God's going to punish me if I don't do this right. Right. But I know Sarah made reference to it. We've got a friend that used to say all the time, she, she just wants to bring a smile to the Lord's face. Mm-hmm. She wants the Lord to be able to look down on her and have a smile. Mm-hmm. Uh, that same that same context, that same thought, will lead us to a point that we don't fear God's punishment, right? But we have such a respect there and a fear within us that we don't ever want to bring shame or bring a frown right. or bring uh, a, a reproach, a reproach, yeah. uh, to the Lord. Uh, the other thing that kind of stuck out to me, uh, uh, just real quickly, is as the author was writing here and said. Let it be noted here that the church of God is a dreadful place. We need to realize and understand the church of God is a dreadful place. And depending on our (laughs) actions, it will either be a dreadful place for Satan or it will be a dreadful place for man. Right, right. But it will be a dreadful place. (laughs) Yes, yes indeed. That reminds me of something. uh, Children don't live in constant fear of their parents. Well, they shouldn't. I mean, they fear their parents especially when they do something wrong, but mm. when they know something's wrong, they avoid it because of that fear right. also. Mm-hmm. And that's, yeah, I'll, I'll be touching a little bit on both of those thoughts here briefly. As, as was already pointed out, this is a really long lesson. I'm Pray for me to figure out how to weed out the parts I need to weed out and insert the parts I need to keep in there. Part one, Israel admonished. Part A, walking according to God's Word. Deuteronomy 13 and 4, Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear Him and keep His commandments and obey His voice and ye shall serve Him and cleave unto Him. If it be objected that the New Testament Christians are not required to obey the law as Moses admonished Israel, let it be understood that the Ten Commandments are eternal law principles. Jesus Himself was emphatically positive on declaring that He did not come to destroy them, that is, the Ten Commandments, or the law, but rather to fulfill them. He solemnly warned against breaking them. Paul tells us, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, as believers in Christ and servants of God. Also, now all these things are happened unto them for in samples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Now, I love Paul and his writing, but let's look at what Jesus has to say about this particular topic as well. Speaking of the law, Jesus said in Matthew 5 and 19, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, in this verse, Jesus didn't say any Jew. He said any one. Jesus never desires to be ambiguous. He, he, his, his words were never, well, did he mean this or did he mean that? But he always clarified his words whenever there could potentially be confusion. And we're talking about Matthew 5, 19. Let's look at Matthew 5, 20. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Ye shall in no case enter into. He said, those who break the law will be least in the kingdom of heaven. But then he says, if if your righteousness doesn't exceed the scribes and the Pharisees, you won't even be able to enter in the first place. His followers were not to be like the Pharisees, who perfectly followed the letter of the law, we read that Paul said that he followed the law perfectly according to the letter, but not according to the Spirit. Those who would take up their cross to follow Jesus would have to do better than that. Walking in the fear of the Lord is not about looking the part. It's not about appearances. 
It's not about how we look, the words we speak, or the places we go, which are only visible to other humans. The fear of God will affect our motivations. Jesus called out the Jews of His day for trying to look good to each other. The fear of the Lord will cause us to desire to do whatever it takes to be what God would have us to be from the inside out. It may not look right to those who it may not look right to those whose fear of the Lord is misplaced. Jonah was called to save those whom he hated. Jeremiah as well as others were condemned by their fellow Jews for speaking the truth. God used those who are willing to submit themselves to him fully in order to reveal the failures of his own people. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> the same is true today. God is looking for willing vessels who will allow themselves to be used as instruments of mercy in a fallen world. Walking in the fear of the Lord will enable us to both hear and receive the instruction that God has for us. The children of God are of the children of God in every era of time are to profit from the Old Testament instructions to his people. Israel was prone to forget, so are we. Israel had heard God's voice and promised to obey him, yet he knew that they would eventually grieve him by their lack of fear. Oh, that they were, there were such an heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always. Part B, fear reflected in service, 2 Kings 17.33. They feared the Lord and they served their own gods after the manner of the nations whom they carried away from thence. There came a time in Israel, his, Israel's history when there was an element among them who quite brazenly professed to fear the Lord even while they rendered their service to gods of their own choice or making. This inconsistent admixture was not done in total ignorance. They knew enough about God to fear Him lest He slay them. They offered something of a superstitious token worship, but they would not serve Him or live for Him. This calls Jesus awesome warning to mind. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Matthew 7, 21-23. In light of much of the current worship, or so-called fear, in its worldly setting, it is not hard to understand Jesus' words. Fear of punishment fades when we don't face a quick judgment for our actions. We read this very thing in Ecclesiastes 8 and 11. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Among so-called Christians, if an act is performed and the conscience doesn't quickly condemn the individual, that immediately becomes permission to continue in the wrong direction. When we walk in the fear of the Lord, we will not press to see how much we can get away with. Rather, we will await a word from, the God, from God or will refrain altogether. We are called to take the church into the world, not to see how much of the world we can bring into the church and still be considered Christians. We need to recognize a superficial fear dressed in worshipful garments if we would appreciate the true fear of God. Fear and holiness. Part A, holiness and the fear of God. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness and the fear of God. 1 Peter 1, 16, 17. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. The fear of God finds its expression in holy worship and consecrated service. Paul points back to God's promises to those who will come out from among those who mingle unrighteousness with righteousness, darkness with light, Belial with Christ, 
infidelity with faith, idolatry with the temple of God, and will be separated from all such. If we would claim the promises, then by means of this, sep his, of this separation, we must cleanse ourselves from all of the unequal filthiness, both from the fleshly filth itself and from the spirit of it. Only then can true holiness do its perfect work, but we must furnish the fear of God. Perfect holiness is the reflection of God's holiness. Peter reminds us that if we are going to call on this Holy Father in time of need, we should pass the remaining time walking in the fear of God, for He is no respecter of persons. He is love and mercy and long-suffering, but in the end, He is also just and uncompromising. And when we truly walk in the proper fear of the Lord, we will understand that, the, that love includes the unpleasant, the uncomfortable, as well as the comfortable and the pleasant. It, it's not, it is not love to allow a child to continually ignore parental instruction. This will lead in the long run to adults who have no concept of responsibility and no understanding of consequences. This is why loving parents correct and discipline their children. I'm not talking about abuse, but proper application of instruction. Why would God be different? He was the one who created the family unit as a direct analogy for His creation and His loving direction in the first place. Parents should understand the difficulty God faces because of their children's behavior. Children with loving parents are obedient not because of a fear of punishment, but because they, fear, they feel their parents' love. They love their parents and do not want to disappoint them. Pastor pointed out a little bit earlier. This perspective has been greatly distorted by the influence of the enemy, but it should give us a reason to pause when we consider how we intend to serve God. Are there any comments? Part B, a forewarning, Luke 12, 4 and 5. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath, after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. There are those who fear the devil and his agents, who will compromise their faith in order to escape death at the hands of persecutors. Jesus says that killing the body is all the devil's agents can do. Satan can fit us for hell, but it is not his to cast men into hell. But those who would save the body at the expense of the soul leave a just God no choice but to cast them into hell when his mercy, patience, kindness, and long-suffering with them have run their course. Jesus says simply but emphatically, Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Once again, it may, be, may have been that fear of punishment that's... Sorry. Once again, it may have been that fear of punishment that the Spirit used to help break the chains that held us to the enemy. But that fear, that type of fear, cannot continue to be our motivation. Consider sep September 16th, 2001. Anyone remember that day right off the top of your head? September 16th, 2001. Some people weren't even born. That was the first Sunday after September 11th, 2001. Nearly every church in the nation was full. There was a fear that gripped this country. A fear that what had happened in New York, in Virginia, and in Pennsylvania might happen again. But as the days, weeks, and months passed, no more planes were hijacked, posing threats to the U.S. Before the long, those churches that had been full slowly began to decline in attendance. We became comfortable in the knowledge that the attacks were over and we could get back to life as usual. As humans, this is how we respond to fear. If, if your house has ever been broken into, 
After that, you feel violated. You're concerned. You, you put up cameras. You do things to, to protect yourself. You might buy a gun. But slowly, over time, you begin to accept the fact that that was a one-time occurrence. And you become lax. And the gun goes in the closet. And you forget about the security cameras. And that's when something happens again. <laughs> Because that fear was, was a, a dread and not a healthy concern. Fear is an important aspect of this life. It has the potential to keep us safe. If you're walking through the woods and you hear a rattle and you jump back, that fear is keeping you safe from that thing that may be over there getting ready to bite you an ankle. If you see a car swerve over into your lane and that fear causes you to uh, adapt your driving techniques to miss it, that fear is there to keep you safe. But it's only for an instant. That fear only benefits for a moment. Yeah, then we'll drive down the road texting somebody. <laughs> fear is an important aspect of his life. It has a potential to keep us safe. But that type of fear, the type of fear that we have, the type of fear that we have is far more important than simply having fear. The more we acknowledge God as the creator, savior, and sustainer of life, the more we will desire to do those things that please Him and avoid those things that make Him look bad. Uh, once again, Pastor touched on this just a little bit earlier. I think uh, just an expansion on that thought. Uh, I heard account one time told that a, a father told his rebellious adolescent son these words. When you behave poorly, you may have to deal with your own consequences personally, but your actions also speak poorly of me because you carry my name with you everywhere you go and in everything you do. Now, if that young man loves and respects his father, he'll take those words to heart and carefully consider his future actions. Is this really that different from how we should behave ourselves when we call ourselves Christians? We carry the name of Christ, and I know every time I say that I have to say, I know, Christ is not a name. But when we call ourselves Christians, we take that name upon us. When we do those things that are against God's will, we bring shame to His name. That should be our fear that the things we do might bring shame to the name of Christ for the person of Christ. Part three, a solemn warning eh, for any thoughts. Mm -hmm. Church of God. Right. And uh, I had to do my best cleaning and, you know, being, because one of them actually called me by my mom's maiden childhood name. Mm -hmm. And uh, he just called me that because I looked like her family. But not only do I have to represent my parents, that my grandparents, my aunts and uncles, but more importantly, I have to, re I have to um, represent Christ. Right. And that's important wherever we go, and basically, you know, that's just saying. I do. Absolutely. Um, I kind of have that, you know, representing our, and we all have to do that, mm -hmm. represent our family name no matter what it is, especially if people know you and know your family and you've been here. Right. So many people will say, yeah, I'm a Christian, but yet, are they Christ or not? Well, it goes right back to what the author put in, what Jesus said. He said, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I say? Right. And that's... In the same way, if you uh, represent your family poorly, you might be known mm -hmm. for the wrong reason. Absolutely. It's the same thing with Christianity. Absolutely. Right. I'm sure there's people in town that it could be 
Jones or Smith. Yeah. It's like, oh, I know that section of Jones or Smith. They're they're bad people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But you go with Andrews or you know, Barrett or you know whatever whatever we go by, mm-hmm. we have you know we have to represent that thing. You know, Every individual is a is a reflection of their parents. Mm-hmm. How you behave reflects your parents, and and. At the same time, we have to we have to be cautious because there's always a potential for us to put on that that cover that makes us look good, and and we have to have the motivation to go along with it, and that's where that fear comes in. Like you're saying, we we desire to to bring uh, honor to the name of Christ by our actions. And a perfect example of that um, at our last church, there was a family in town. <laughs> To them, to the family themselves, their family name was so honorable and so sacred. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they really thought they had that reputation that, you know, well, because of this individual, my, whether it was father or grandfather, whoever you were talking to at the time, um, because of his faith, you know, we were good. You know, and there were some individuals that thought that um, because that's what how they would talk. But you talk to anybody else in town, oh, well, I wouldn't trust that person for nothing. Or, oh, they really let so and so down. And, mm-hmm. You know, so and so would roll over in their grave if they saw the rest of the way right. their family's acting. Uh, you're saying, well, you, you really got to. Um, but that, that pers- perfectly describes yeah. what, we, what we see in the New Testament with the Pharisees and Sadducees. Mm-hmm. They had a. A air of superiority about them because of who they were, but it was not reflected in their lives and in, in their behaviors. And, and sadly, uh, we see a lot of that same thing. Uh, I'm not going to pick on the church, but I'm going to say we we see a lot of that same thing in Christianity today. We see those individuals who have that face of humility. That that fa- I've I've heard ministers say, I just don't think I can do this because because it's uh, it's just not it's it's too high for me. This is this is too much of a responsibility. I, I don't feel I don't feel capable. And you know, because you know the individual, this is this is a false humility. They're just they're they're speaking words that make themselves look better. So they'll be even more likely to get this thing that they're saying they're just too humble to bear on themselves because they're just so humble. I think I've heard people say humble brag. That, that's, that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about the fear of the Lord. The true fear of the Lord. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Son or a grandson that just completely destroy. You know, if they mm-hmm. don't have a Cleveland, well, and they go bankrupt a couple generations down, mm-hmm. then that name will be forgotten. It'll well, be, you know, whatever. There are names. Yeah. We should hold the name of Christ. It yeah. is hard. It is. Because we are a family trying to serve the Lord. Mm-hmm. And there's so many of our um, family members, so mm-hmm. to speak. You know, I'm reaching out way out to anybody right. who calls themselves Christian. They're family members, mm-hmm. quotes, right. of the Christian people that call themselves Christians. Right. And it's destroyed the name of Christ. It has basically destroyed the family name. Right, absolutely. And, you know, it's sad because if you go up now and you want to um, speak to an individual, they automatically say, oh, you're a Christian. You're one of them. You're one of them. And yeah. you don't know for sure, mm-hmm. I guess, what part of the family they're on. <laughs> You know, if they're really, you know, a good yep. Christian or a good Smith and mm-hmm. wanting the best for you, or are they just the bad part of town or the mm-hmm. bad part of the family? Yeah. They just want your money. They're just hypocrites. There are there are those families in Cleveland that, that have that exact uh, description that you said where those generations before, everybody respected them, everybody loved them, but now uh, that's gone. And, and that... that same thing that we see, not only in the Bible, 
but in our modern world and the, and the people that we look and, and see today, all of those are here for our examples to show us the dangers of our actions, the dangers. Once again, I, I, love, I love the Sermon on the Mount because anyone who says, well, the law is for them, but it's not for us. Jesus specifically said in the Sermon on the Mount things, ye have heard, but I say unto you. So he took a, 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 a text from the law and he said, ye have heard, don't kill. But I say unto you, if you're angry with your brother, you've already murdered him in your heart, you're just as much, you're just as much a murderer as if you'd taken a knife and killed him. So what, what the Sermon on the Mount there did in that portion was to tell us that it's more, of, more than simply the actions that we take. But it's the motivations of the mind. As the Bible would say, the motivations of the heart. Those are the things that will lead us to heaven or take us to hell. The choices we make will, will reveal to those around us whom we serve. And we want to bring honor. Not, I want to bring honor not only to God, but to this local church. I, I don't want anyone to speak poorly of this local church because of my actions. And so that, that is a motivation for me to not only have that face that looks good, but have that heart that when it comes down to it, whether I'm thinking about it or not, I'm automatically going to do those things that please God because that's my motivation. That's my sincere desire. Great comments this morning. I'm going to try to get through this last part, see what we can do. I may just read the Scripture. A solemn warning, part three. The consequences of disobedience. Deuteronomy 28, 58, and 59. If thou wilt not observe to do all the words of this law that are written in this book, that thou mayest fear this glorious and fearful name, the Lord thy God. Then the Lord will make thy plagues wonderful. That wonderful is not good. And the plagues of thy seed, even great plagues, and of long continuance and sore sickness and of long continuance. Again, we must defend God's law and its holy and eternal principles. Certain ceremonial laws have served their purpose, their true intent having been revealed and fulfilled by Christ. But, we are still, but they are still analogous. When rightly divided, we must still observe to do all the words of this law that are written, all the words of this law that are written in this book. Our book is the Bible. Let's skip down here. Um, plagues can be corrective if responded to, but many histor historical plagues wrought death to thousands who disdained the fear of God. <clears throat> God rarely, if ever, strikes someone dead the moment they first rebel against Him. Going back to what I said earlier, that's, that's not the fear of God that we should have because that very rarely, if ever, happens. Rather, He grants us all multiple opportunities to acknowledge our failures and repent. Such was the case throughout the Old Testament. People say that all oh, the God of the Old Testament was never merciful. He was amazingly merciful throughout the Old Testament. The warnings and discipline may have increased as they continued to be ignored, but nothing came upon the Jews that they hadn't had plenty of time to correct before destruction came upon them. Their final chapter becomes a warning of the seriousness of God and His perfect will. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now this doesn't mean that souls can't fall. It doesn't mean that souls can't fail. It simply means that if God had His way, no one would be disobedient to the point of destruction. But He gives us the choice. He doesn't force His will upon us. Probably one of, the, one of my most quoted verses of Scripture, <laughs> in Sunday school anyway, Deuteronomy 30 and 19. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. This is God's will, that we would make the right choice. He will not force us to do what He wants us to do but He gives us the option. 
serve God acceptably. Part B, Hebrews 12, 28, 29, Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. The author of the epistle to Hebrews compares and contrasts the law covenant and the new covenant, or the covenant of grace. The two concluding verses, 28 and 29, admonish us to hold fast to God's grace if we would serve God acceptably. And acceptably means with reverence and godly fear. Excuse me. I'm going to skip down to the bottom of that paragraph. Let's see, last two sentences it looks like. Yeah, the next paragraph. If we stop at Hebrews 12, 24, we miss the whole point. Verses 25 through 27 are, an awesome, war are awesome warnings. Lest our jubilation should, be, should so carry us away in ecstasy that we fail to hear Him that speaketh from heaven. Lest we, we carelessly lose the fear of God and endanger our souls to the in the final shaking time. This is made more clear in Hebrews 10, 26 through 31. Verse 29 should both stir our fear and send us to our knees in worshipful consecration. Of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. How do we trod God underfoot? How do we try, trod Christ underfoot? By seeing and hearing His Word and His will and then thinking we're living up to it when we're actually falling short. That's what the, that's what the Pharisees and Sadducees did. And what, what did we say in the beginning? Jesus, what did Jesus say in the beginning of this lesson? If your righteousness doesn't exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees and the, and the scribes, they looked the part. They looked righteous. They seemed to be fulfilling the law, but they were actually falling short. They were missing the point. They showed a false face, as it were, and didn't do God's will according to His Word. But simply simply showed themselves as if they were faithful when they were not. I'm not going to read the conclusion. I'm not going to have time. I hope that somebody has I hope that everybody has read this lesson. I do want to no, I'm just going to stop right there. Are there any comments?